All right. So, yeah, like I, Betsy said, we can skip past all that. Um, I'm going to try to talk for maybe, uh, I don't know, say 30, 40, no more than 40 minutes. Um, I'll try to pause here and there, um, see if there's any questions. Uh, but hopefully we'll get, you know, as quickly two questions as possible. Um, so, like uh, Betsy said, I'm unusually uh, interested in parliamentary procedure and Robert's rules, et cetera. Um, and the reason for that is that I see them as a tool for justice and fairness and for efficiency. <laughs> um, if you use them correctly, I think it's the way that you make good decisions and just decisions in large groups, uh, but it's certainly possible to use them in ways that sort of weaponize them. And that is a way to get injustice and unfairness. So that's why I'm so kind of into explaining them and helping folks get the, the hang of how it works, because the more people that understand how to use them correctly, uh, the more likely you're going to get good outcomes and efficient and less frustrating meetings. So, because I have sat through way too many frustrating meetings in my day. So um, here's everything you need to know about Robert's Rules, and I'm going to do it in a way that I don't really explain to you Robert's Rules, or that is, I'm not going to tell you too much about like you know, what Rob's actually says about particular things. Um, what I rather, what I think is better to do is try to think about some underlying principles because there's, if you understand just a few things about kind of what's motivating the rules, you can basically figure out most things. Um, there's some details and weird cul-de-sacs you get into, but I mean, 99% of the time, you, you don't need to know the details to, you know, basically apply them. So all parliamentary procedure is uh, there to help a deliberative body do its job. So, you know, we start kind of like Aristotle would have a start. We ask what a deliberative body is. It's just a body that deliberates. It's a group of individuals that have to figure out somehow to how to act together collectively. And it's important, you know, for us to get our jobs done in Senates and whatnot, that we have disagreements. It would be totally pointless to have meetings if we didn't all disagree about things. And, you know, if we didn't disagree, we probably would make terrible, terrible decisions. So a deliberative body is just a group of people that's together that's trying to make decisions um, who are going to disagree. And that's, I think, the, the fundamental feature that differentiates kind of cases in which you need something like Robert's Rules from cases where it's like a bunch of friends trying to decide uh, what to have for dinner, like unless you're like lawyers or I don't know, maybe philosophers, you probably don't want, um, you know, to decide dinner plans by a series of motions, but I don't know. I mean, the more I say that, I'm sort of talking myself into it, but I guess that's me because I'm weird. Um, so here it is. Here's the two things I think that if you get your head around this, you basically know what you need to know about Robert's Rules. Um, it's two principles. Um, the deliberative body is there to act, it's to do stuff, right? We make decisions together, we enact policies, we do stuff. So we have to be able to do stuff. Um, at the same time, it's made up out of individuals and each individual is just as equally special and equally important as any other individual. So you have two kind of competing concerns. You have to be able to get stuff done, but you have to make sure that everybody has a voice in what happens. So these are kind of the two basic principles, I think, and I'm, I'm gonna shoehorn a little bit as we go to kind of make these explain everything. It's a little shoehorny, but hey, you know, come on, give me a break. So the basic, here's my t-shirt version of the underlying principle behind Robert's rules. The opponents to a, a measure, or an idea, they have to get their say, but eventually the majority has to get its way. And by get it say, their say, I mean, not just like try to convince um, the people who are eventually gonna be in the majority that you know, to take on their view, uh, which that is part of it, but they also have to be able to affect the outcome. So opponents have to be able to basically make uh, the thing that they're going to vote against at the end of the day as palatable as possible for them. So that's the real nugget, I think, of like pretty much everything in Robert's Rules uh, is we need to be able to act, but we need to do it in a way that makes sure everybody has a chance to contribute to what we actually do at the end of the day. So the mechanics of how we do it um, is by answering a series of questions. So questions are um, just, well, sorry, I'm gonna use the word kind of like question 
interchangeably with motion. I'm sure you're all well aware of that. You know, you move to do something, right? Somebody seconds your motion. Um, but those are just questions. It's so you'll have a main motion, which is the thing that your your topic. So for sentence, a lot of times it's a, a policy item, right? You've got a draft. Um, I can't remember what you guys call them, executive orders or memoranda or something like that. My campus, we just I don't know what we call them, which is policies. Um, but you know, you have a draft one of those. On the ACSU, we have you know bigger, complicated resolutions a lot of the time. Um, but that's your main motion. That's the kind of the fundamental basic feature thing. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of other kinds of motions that help you do your business, that help you figure out what you want to do with that main motion. Um, just one quick note, um, resolutions, I'll sometimes mention resolutions and refer to them kind of interchangeably with motions. They're just fancy uh, main motions. Resolutions are the things that if you use the old school, you know, it's the whereas, 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 therefore be it resolved, resolved, resolved. Or if you use the new school, which you should, uh, it's just resolved and then, you know, rationale at the bottom. That's the style that the ASCSU uses. So there's basically three kind of operational principles that come out when you're thinking about the sort of structure of the discussion and the debate. Um, the first is, I just, I give them these kind of, not ideal names, but whatever. Uh, I call it, it takes two, and it is just what it says it is. Um, no one person can get the, the body to do anything. It's, it always takes two people to get the body to do something. But if two people think that the body needs to discuss something or consider, you know, some procedural thing, then the body has to consider it. So this is the, the root of the whole, you know, seconding everything process. Um, and again, it's just sort of motivated by the fact that we need to do stuff. And if you've got a hundred people and each person gets to like bring their own hobby horse to the table, like just by themselves, well, you see how that gets kind of, you know, unwieldy very quickly, right? So you need at least two people to think that something is worth the, the body's time. So that's kind of, again, you're balancing that kind of principle that we need to be able to act, but everybody needs to be able to equally able to bring stuff before the body. Then we get into the main, you know, kind of sticky thing, and I'll, I'll try to give an example in a little bit, um, but I'll just kind of try to talk through it right now. Um, we only ever consider one question at a time. So you start off with your main motion, and then you do all sorts of subsidiary things to that. Sometimes you just debate it and vote on it. That's great. But a lot of times there's going to be amendments. And so once you have an amendment, you have a new question and you only talk about that amendment. You can't go back and talk. You can't be talking about the main motion when the thing in front of you is an amendment. Somebody might decide to, say, uh, propose that the thing on the thing that's before you be tabled. So then, well, actually, you can't debate tabling. but you know, that's the only thing that you can act on at that time. So it's a it's a first in last out stack. It's, you know, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute, um, but we only ever deal with the question that's at the top. And then here's the one that's really tricky in terms of how it actually plays out, but it's super important. We have to make progress by answering these questions and we only answer a question once. We never answer the same question twice. There's a way that sometimes you, you can do things, uh, processes for reconsidering, but there essentially you're creating a new question that's, you know, sort of, that's, you know, you get the point. So once you reject an amendment, you cannot propose that exact same amendment. Now, it gets really weird, and I'll talk about this in a second, because you can, you know, propose to put the same text somewhere else. You can propose to do something slightly different, but you can't, once we've decided against something, um, that thing is out. You, you never go back and redo it. So that's the kind of three operational principles that are the sort of the most important. Um, there's another one that I sometimes call uh, Goldthwaite's principle after the uh, previous ASCSU parliamentarian who kind of mentored me. Um, he would always just kind of, when something, things started to get crazy and people were confused about, you know, what's going on, he would always just say, sit back and very sagely say, um, the body must be able to act as it pleases. And that's basically the idea behind action, that the rules are never there to get in the way of us doing what we need to do. And if you think that the rules are in the way, well, A, you're probably wrong, but B, if they are genuinely in the way, you know, it's gonna be really cumbersome to do something that we all agree we wanna do, then you just 
uh, vote to waive the rules uh, or to suspend the rules temporarily. So again, these are the principles that guide us in how we actually act. Um, it's sorry, I was messing around with the PowerPoint little like auto suggest feature, and apparently it thinks that these are dragons. But all right, you know, good on you, AI. So amendments is where everything gets really complicated, right? The straightforward, you know, something gets introduced, you debate, you vote. That doesn't require much explanation, right? But once you start getting into amendments, that's where, um, well, if you're on the ASCSU, you make your parliamentarian's life a living hell because the ASCSU is some of, the, I think Holly is, can attest to seeing this, is some of the finest wordsmithers that the CSU system has ever put together and the most diabolical users of commas. It's, it gets pretty ridiculous up in there. So again, once you have decided something, you can't take it up again. Um, so if something like uh, there's a motion to call the question, which means to move directly to a vote on something without a debate, you can't sort of immediately recall the question. There has to be either another motion or there has to be some debate or something has to happen. Because again, you only do things one time. That for amendments means that the same piece of text cannot be put or taken out of the place that it was proposed to be put in or taken out if that was voted down. Now you can put it somewhere else. You can add additional words. You can put slightly different text in. It gets really stupid really fast, um, not to be overly pejorative, but it does. Um, and this is where things get really messy um, in a hurry. And I'll say a little bit in just a second about kind of some best practices to avoid the mess, but that's your basic guideline is like, if you're asking yourself, um, is this amendment that somebody's proposing in order? The, thing, the question you should ask yourself is, did we already consider these words in that spot? That's way oversimplifies it, but that, that will get you a decent amount of the way. The second thing, and this is the part that drives, um, well, it's, it's the fun part of Robert's rules. It's probably the, the entire point to, for having the parliamentarian. It's questions of germaneness. So a, uh, an amendment has to be germane to the text that you're, um, you're amending. So if you have a resolution that says um, uh, the, the Chico faculty think cats are the best, you can't amend that by saying the Chico faculty think that they should all get raises, right? That's one is an attitude about a domestic animal. The other is, you know, the funds by which you support said domestic animals. So it, in order for an amendment to be okay, it has to be germane. That means it has to be basically on the same subject. Um, now that gets kind of weird as the example here I have suggests, and this is actually an example that's directly in Robert's rules, um, that you could have a, um, like a resolution of praising somebody like, Praising, you know, your Senate chair, or whatever. Um, uh, we'll say ASCSU senator. I don't want to put Jeff on the spot because I'm sure we would only have a resolution that praises Jeff. But you know, you can. It's in. It's in order to strike out the word um, praise and put in condemn, right? Because both are examples of an attitude that you're taking towards the person, right? So it's gets really messy really fast. But that's kind of the, the question that you ask yourself on the germane issue is, is it the same kind of thing? Is it the same sort of topic or something like that? Um, I, there's a lot more to be said about that and I'm not gonna say it unless people want me to go into that later. Um, spoiler alert, you don't want me to go into that later because there's a lot to be said that you don't need to know it really. So again, Basic things you need to know for amendments is that once something has been decided, you don't get to talk about, you know, you can't do the same thing again, but it's very, but you, that's very narrow because you can actually put the same language somewhere else. You just, all you've decided is that we're not putting those words in this particular spot, or we're not taking out these particular words. All right. Um, one thing that's often kind of folks get confused about, I guess, is that there's a thought you can't make an amendment to something that you're going to oppose, right? So if you're, you know, going to vote against the, the main motion at the end, sometimes people uh, think that you can't actually introduce amendments, but that's exactly wrong, right? And our little principle of equality 
tells you why, right? The idea is that even if you oppose the thing at the end of the day, you still have to be able to make it as palatable to yourself as possible. So in fact, in a way, it's like the people who are the opponents have the biggest, or you know, it's most important for them to be the ones that are able to introduce amendments because you have to be able to make it as palatable as possible. Um, amending amendments, yes, you can do it. Um, you cannot amend amend uh, you cannot amend an amendment to an amendment. That way lies madness. But the way to think about it is, and or sorry, the reason why you can amend an amendment is that once you've decided to say put some text in a particular spot, that text can't be changed. You you're done, right? That's the no double consideration thing. You can strike out the whole like the bigger section that that text was added to, but once you put in something, you're stuck. So basically once the first order amendment opens the question of like, what should we put here? You can have further discussions about, oh, okay, maybe we should put that in there. Maybe we should put this in there. I'll give you an example in just a second, but that's, um, that's the rationale is that the second order amendments allow you to decide what's gonna go into a spot or, or come out. Uh, because once that decision about the first order amendment is made, then you, you're stuck, you're fixed. Um, but I should say, almost all the time that you start to wonder about amending an amendment to an amendment or even just second order amendments, a lot of the time it's really easier to just vote down the amendment that's in front of you and propose a brand new one. Um, it's usually the best approach. It keeps things way cleaner and way easier. Um, and then you don't end up two amendments deep and then everyone's confused about what was decided when. Um, so, again, Keep your amendments simple, please. Um, it's better to, a lot of times somebody will have like, oh, I've got like five different amendments I wanna make and they're kind of related. Um, it's best for the chair in those circumstances to kind of, instead of doing the usual like alternating who speaks and what order, um, to just kind of like say, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll take them one at a time. I'll give you, you know, sort of precedence to introduce the five amendments <laughs> um, because otherwise people start to sh try to shoehorn things together and it just doesn't work. It's gets really messy. Um, in, if you're amending a resolution, um, I, I know you guys probably don't do that as much as you do uh, policies, but you want to avoid skipping amendments that are going to kind of cut across different paragraphs or different resolve causes if it's a in a resolution format. Um, again, that has implications for how, uh, for what can be in order going down the line. And this is, again, like I said, the thing that keeps me as the parliamentarian, like fully engaged during the ASU meeting, because it's like, sometimes if you let an amendment happen in a certain way, um, it totally cuts out the ability to do things down the road. And so, and there get to be some very subtle problems. So again, it's best to keep things as narrow as possible and to always break them up as, as, as much as you can. Um, all right. Friendly amendments, just don't say the word friendly amendment. There's no such thing as a friendly amendment. Um, I have a little essay thing that's linked there. I, it's in the links that I put in the chat earlier um, where there technically kind of is a such a thing as a friendly amendment, but sorry, I should have said what, what people think a friendly amendment is, is that, you know, like Betsy proposes something and I second it, the chair, you know, states the amendment and then somebody else has an idea. Oh, we, maybe it should, you should have said this. And they say, oh, I have a friendly amendment. And the idea they think is that all Betsy has to do is say, yeah, that's actually what I wanted to say. Um, and that means, and that just changes the, the actual amendment. That is not acceptable because once the chair states an amendment, it belongs to the body. You cannot change things. And I have an explanation in this little essay about um, why that's a bad thing. And it basically the whole, what I try to do is explain how amendments work with, you know, using this as a lens. So if you want to look at that and are in a glutton for punishment or need some well-deserved sleep, go right ahead. All right. Um, this is where I was going to show you amendments. I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but we'll try it. So let me see if I can change my screen. Okay, so what you're looking at here is something that's probably not a good idea. Um, this is the, during the pandemic, I, because my Senate was, um, shall we say, not functioning in a high trust environment. Um, 
we weren't willing to take votes and things like that on Zoom uh, because, you know, you can see who votes. So I basically wrote a whole program that uh, allows us allowed us to vote and does elections for us and things like that. So this is the, it kind of has a lot of Robert's rules integrated in. So this is the motion stack. And I'll just try to walk through a little bit of what's happening here. This is, by the way, an example I give during orientation, but for my Senate, but we usually work through it. I unfortunately didn't have the time, time to be pedagogically good and you know do that for us. But anyways, so we start off with the main motion that the dog not be given hamburgers. Then some of the dog partisans want to weaken that a bit by adding in the amendment, the dog adding the word or adding, you know, 100 before hamburgers. So that amendment then fails. So then the dog, we're back to that the dog not be given hamburgers. And then the dog partisans want to go, you know, sort of whole hog here. And they strike out the word not and replace it with who is very good. So we've now changed it from saying the motion being dog doesn't get hamburgers to the dog does get hamburgers, right? Then we have a secondary amendment about, you know, well, let's not say it's very good. Let's say it's the best dog ever that passes. So that's the thing that's on the table. There's of course, lots of debate. So somebody calls the question that passes, which means we vote immediately on it, blah, blah, blah. So suppose we're right in the middle of this, you know, complicated discussion about dogs and hamburgers. And we realize that a more important order item of business needs to be taken care of. So somebody moves that we pen, we table the pending matter. Tabling something requires a simple majority and you should never, ever, ever move to table something that you are trying to kill. Tabling does not kill and you will bite you in the butt if you try to do it that way. Because the reason all tabling is, is just taking it off. It's literally just kind of putting it on the table, putting it aside so we can do something else for the time being, and then picking it right back up. If you want to kill something without voting directly on it, you move to postpone indefinitely. But tabling does not kill it. This is a bad idea because say you um, move to table something, you have to leave the meeting early. Well, now the, your opponents can just move to take it from the table. It only takes a majority to bring it back and it can be passed without you being there. So we can table the Can I interrupt the, there the and issue. ask, can I ask yeah. you something right there? Sorry. But can you table something till the next meeting? You run out of time, your meeting needs to be over and you're just okay. tabling it till the ne next time. So good question. Um, Thank you. Yes. Uh, there's a couple of ways that can happen. Number one is just if you are you run out of time, then you run out of time and it automatically comes back on the next agenda under basically existing business or however your Senate, you know, sort of lists that out. You can also, if you're sort of getting near the end of the meeting or you have other things to do, you can postpone definitely, which just means you postpone it to a particular time and that particular time could be the next meeting. You can also just table it, but that's, the only little risk is like that somebody could try to move it, you know, take it back off the table during the present meeting. If that's not an issue, then just saying table is fine enough. Does that help? Yeah, it's a little subtle in the, the details of like how these different things play out, but it, it matters a lot for kind of when things are contentious. So anyways, um, we take up the next order of business, which is that the CSUN cats be invited to every Senate meeting. That of course passes unanimously then we take it from the table and then we you know, move on with that. So I don't know if that was helpful, but the idea was, is supposed was, sorry, this is supposed to illustrate just that you have a stack. It's a first in last out kind of stack. So, you know, you start here, you start adding motions to it. Whatever motion is on the top governs what else you can add to it. And as you vote on things, you take those motions off the top and, you know, eventually you end up on a vote to something that's been amended and you know you dispose of that. Then you move on to the next thing. You can see at CSUN we have very important matters that our Senate deals with, you know, curriculum regarding the study of tacos, uh, CSUN cats being invited, and you know, dogs and hamburgers. All right, so get back to this. All right, so just a couple more topics. Um, and it's almost on time. So just again, I'm just kind of trying to talk through a few things that are pretty high level, but you know, once you get the hang of them, they should hopefully help uh, more broadly. So 
Here's the one question that comes up a lot is how much many votes something requires. And there's a very simple heuristic to this. If you're doing something, it's a majority. If you are doing something that affects the rights of um, either the, the Senate as a whole or um, any particular member, um, it's going to require two thirds. And this is just that, you know, sort of uh, balance between action and equality, right? Sometimes we need to just move on. And that's what something like calling the question is for. Calling the question, um, you know, ending debate on the on the particular matter at hand and moving directly to a vote on it, that takes two thirds because you are taking away the rights of people on the speaker's list to speak. Um, same sort of thing, like, oops, sorry. Or I told you I'm bad at uh, PowerPoint. Um, changing an approved agenda, like once you've decided what the agenda is, um, people might, you know, have kind of scheduled around it, especially if the approval came in advance. Um, so it requires two thirds in order to do that. Everything else requires a majority. So that's the simple heuristic. Are we taking away someone's rights? If so, two thirds. If anything else, it's a majority. One thing that's, by the way, useful sometimes if you find yourself in a hole, like where there, you know, there's a hole, like you're on a second order amendments that never seem to stop. This is, saves our bacon all the time in the ASCSU. Um, when you call the question, ah, I have to realize that I can't click on that, sorry. Um, when you call the question, you can specify what questions you're calling. It's not, it, so it's not just the one that's necessarily the one previously before you. You can say, I call the pending two questions or I call all pending questions. And if that passes, then what that means is um, you would say you're on a second order amendment, somebody moves to call all pending questions and that passes. You vote first on the second order amendment, then you vote on the first order amendment, then you vote on the main motion and without any further, do any further debate. So it's a useful trick to, that gets you out of trouble sometimes. Um, all right. I'm sure this is probably obvious to everyone uh, or something that every once in a while comes up. A majority is um, more than half. So you, if there's a tie vote, it's not a majority, it fails. Anything else other than a majority, so if you have two thirds or uh, at the ASUSU, we have one thing that requires three quarters, that's greater than or equal to. So, you know, it's at least two thirds, but a majority is um, more than half, right? So this is why um, I believe uh, Betsy has experience with doing this, where the chair, you know, generally, I'll talk about chairs in just a second, but chairs, you know, you, you generally don't vote unless your vote is kind of going to de decide things. And the only two cases in which that's going to happen is if you are creating a tie or breaking a tie. Right. And I believe that it has some experience with creating a tie in order to defeat something in a very fun vote of no confidence, if I remember right. Thanks for the All revisit right. on the trauma. Yeah, you know, I, I like to make sure you never forget about that. <laughs> um, one question that comes up all the time, and I have to admit, this is like, for me, kind of a, um, you know, kind of a minor trigger is uh, abstentions. So sometimes people say, well, how do you count the abstentions? You don't. It's very simple. There's no such thing as an abstention. Or to be a little bit more, you know, sort of metaphysically correct, um, abstentions are absences of votes. They are like holes, right? They are, you know, evil is the absence of good. Poverty is the absence of wealth. Abstentions are the absence of votes. So there is no difference between somebody being in the bathroom or the coffee shop when a vote happens and failing to vote or them not saying yes or no when the vote is called for. Abstentions never count in the denominator. And in fact, you know, this is my sort of extreme example. If you had something that was so controversial with 100 senators and 99 of them didn't say yes or no, and only one said voted in favor, still passes. It's a majority. It's a majority of one. So there you go. All right, um, move on a little quicker. So please, sympathy for your chair. Jeff, I feel your pain. It ain't easy to chair. <laughs> Sharon is really hard. It's really hard to do, a good, do it. Um, so everybody just please you know, show your chair some love. Uh, go ahead, Holly. 
Back to the question of majority and abstentions and such, with the majority, you would still need a quorum though, right? You can't? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, it's one of those dicey things, right? Um, Technically, anybody who notices that a quorum is not present is supposed to say it. And as soon as you notice that the quorum is not present, meeting's over. However, there's been times when I've been running a meeting and I noticed that we are getting very close to a, you know, losing a quorum and we need to get stuff done. And I'm kind of like, nobody say the Q word. And then someone's like, what, quorum? I'm like, ah. So yeah, you always need a quorum to do any kind of business. All right. What's a chair for? Chair exists to save a deliberative body from themselves. That's my slogan. Um, that means, you know, they apply the rules and manage the business the floor. The chair isn't a monarch, you know, chair, this is what makes being a chair really hard is you have to, you know, just make sure the things function and kind of bite your tongue sometimes because you have to recognize anybody that has a right to the floor. Um, the fun fact, you some I won't tell you the details because I don't want you doing this, but there's cases in which if a chair refuses to recognize someone, then that person can actually basically take over the chairship and conduct a vote. Um, I've never seen that happen, but it is on my bucket list of weird things that I kind of like to see happen, just, but I probably don't. Um, chair is supposed to be really, new, you know, supposed to be neutral. Um, this again is hard because, and especially in groups like us, because our chairs are usually also representatives. So it's hard to kind of, to, you know, navigate that fine line between, you know, sort of um, representing your constituency, but also maintaining the appearance of neutrality. Because when things get, you know, contentious and nasty, like the chair is there to save everybody from themselves. So again, just give Jeff some love, everybody, because it ain't easy. <laughs> um, one thing that's uh, just, and this is mostly for, uh, it's, it's sort of a good practice for a chair. Um, no chair gets things right all the time, even when they're um, not weird procedural things, uh, with the exception, of course, of, Vice Chair Boyd, who did an amazing job running the plenary uh, for us last time. And hopefully she will be our Chair Boyd for the ASUSU next year. We'll see. Uh, but with Betsy aside, all of us as chairs make mistakes. And so it's, you know, if you as a member think that the chair is making a mistake, you can just call, you just appeal the, rule, the ruling of the chair. Um, it's a debatable motion. It requires a second and it, it's a majority. And in fact, one thing that um, I've always found really useful as a chair is like if you're getting in the dicey territory, like it's not really clear what rule applies or how to do something, just say like, you know, I'll just say like, okay, I'm going to rule this way. Please somebody appeal it so that we can, you know, then vote to decide which way we're going. Because again, what matters is that we do what the body wants us to do. All right, um, I'm not sure how useful this is. I asked Betsy for like, what have you guys been talking about? And she gave me a list and I picked on like probably the most unimportant thing, um, which is uh, consent calendars. And I mainly wanted to talk about this just because it lets me talk about two other things and make a, an appeal on that. So um, knowing what we know from you know, our two principles, um, a consent calendar is again, you know, it's, a, it's a group of, you know, things that we're either going to vote on together or vote on individually, but with no debate. So we know that because of action, they're there to help us do our business. Um, and we, given equality, we know that we need to be careful with them because we don't want to take away people's rights to contribute. So that's why they require, generally speaking, unanimous consent. So I was going to derive this a little bit more, but that's basically what you can see from Robert's rules when it's talking about that um, consent calendar is called over periodically at a point established by the agenda by a special rule of order, um, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, it just describes how it is. So the question that I, uh, Betsy had asked a while back of me, and I don't even know if this is still topical. Sorry, Betsy, I should probably ask you about this if it was still topical, um, was like whether or not um, approving the agenda is, is ipso facto approving the consent calendar? Um, and the answer is no. Um, but the reason why I wanted to talk about this is it's kind of interesting to sh talk about a couple other things. So for one, you know, you can see why just by the, our principle of like one question at a time, right? You'd be doing two things at the same time. You'd be answering, is this our agenda? And are we approving of all these things? Um, and also it's clear in the language of, of Roberts there. But let's skip past that. 
and just think about what an agenda is, right? So an agenda is just a to-do list. Um, it has two kinds of things on it. It has what's called general orders and special orders, or as we often call them, like time certains. Um, it just is a to-do list. It's how are we going to do things? What order are we going to do them in? Um, it's totally possible to have a meeting without an agenda. You should not do this. It will make me cry if you try to do this in my presence. Uh, but it's totally they aren't required. It's just a really good idea. And again, it only requires the majority to approve an agenda, but it, changing it once it's approved requires two thirds. So it's important to kind of make sure that you get what you want on there at the beginning. Now for my real pride to you. It mentioned in, Rob, in that section of Roberts that I you know, skipped past really quick that the consent calendar in order to have it, you know, it has to be defined by a, a special rule of order. And a special rule of order is just like any other rule of order. It, um, it's something that you as a body set up to help guide you in your practices. Um, for example, at the ASCSU, we have a special rule, rule of order that says you can only have three in favor on any motion that's debatable. There's three in favor, three against, and then you have to move to, you know, sort of re recent the cat, the, the tally of it. Or um, another thing we have now is a interruption practice where if somebody's getting out of line, um, you can basically interrupt them and say, hey, this isn't cool. And they're like, oh, my bad. And then we'll move on. Those are all defined in special rules of order. So the priority goes your constitution, your bylaws, any special rules of order that you've enacted. Robert's rules fills in all the gaps and then kind of custom and past practice. Um, those are all binding on you, but you know that's what they are. And now, finally, here is my- I have a question real quick. Can yeah. I- um, on on slide 32, you have a, a citation of a 41 colon, I think, 34. Uh, I'm trying to find your your quote there. Can you explain to me the, the reference? Because I'm having trouble finding it. Oh, it should be in, it's in the, the white, sorry. Yeah, thank you for that. Like, Before you move on, I had a question. Can you go back to the slide on Constitution and so forth that you were just on? Uh, yes. So the bylaws, we have our own policy for FASP and EPPC. Mm -hmm. And so that would trump Robert's rules um, if we're doing things differently. So is where is that in the list or it just is? Yeah, so I guess they would be like um, special rules for the um, your committees. So it would be they special might not have rules. that name, but yeah, they're effectively that, right? Okay. They're approved by the committee by a majority, and they they last for the more than one year. They last for one year. Oh, do they have to be reapproved every year? Yes. So I think that that's technically what's called a standing rule of order, uh, which is basically the same thing. It's just slightly more impermanent. So it'd be it would go special rule, standing rule, Roberts rules, custom. But I don't usually talk about those because anyways, but yeah, it's, it's basically the same thing. Thank you. So my final plea to you is this. Please write things down. Make a lot of special rules of order because whenever you have, you know, I'm sure you have never run into this in your Senate, but, you know, there's a way that things have been done that a lot of folks, you know, Think this is the way we do it's done and then somebody goes wait why do we do it that way and they're like oh no, it's totally in the rules and then you go looking for the rule and you can't find the rule where it says that that's the thing the way that you do it and then everything falls apart because that's the moment in which you needed that rule to be like actually a thing <laughs> so i just implore you i've consulted with a lot of senates and a lot of different groups and Usually I don't get called in because things are going very badly. Um, and it's almost always for something like this where um, there's just disagreement about the status of, of um, a, a rule or a practice. Um, Robert's Rules does say that your customs and past practices are binding, right? You can't just kind of throw them out the window. But, the same, but that's, I, I think, I hope we can all agree, that's not ideal to have things that are not written down because it makes it harder for new people when they come in to know how things work. And this is just kind of my real plea. Um, you can't make it better if you don't have something to, to look at, right? So we're never gonna get our rules, you know, especially when they, you know, it's like 
things are complicated. You're never going to get it right the first time. So, but if you don't have something that's actually written down that you can keep revisiting and, and edit, like you're never going to make it better. So again, my plea is write things down, create a whole bunch of special rules. Then that way everybody can, when things are tough, know where to look and know what to do. Um, and with that, we are, that's the last bit of my presentation. Um, in the slides, I have some links to some little uh, documents that I have made that explain various things, but um, that's, that's all I got for you. Any questions? Sorry, I went over, yeah, man, 10 minutes more. So uh, Miriam, then Holly. Thank you, yeah. So something that's come up, um, and I'm new to chairing, but is there a general rule about what constitutes a change being editorial? Like sometimes oh. we're talking about words and is it editorial or not? Yeah, this is some this is an area where things get comp are, are hard because um there's no hard no matter how hard you try, you're never gonna find a hard line between, you know, substantive and editorial, right? Sometimes it's just a comma, right? Who cares? But sometimes commas save lives. Let's eat grandma versus let's eat comma grandma. You know? So sorry, that's my example anytime this comes up. Um, so I think it's one of those things that as a, a chair and as a, a committee, you know, you just kind of have to, you know, basically it, it, you ask like, does this seem editorial? Are we okay with it? And if everyone's like, yeah, it's fine. You know, um, then you just, it's editorial. But if it's, you, you want to kind of err on the side of it, not being editorial where it actually needs like discussion and a vote just because you know the kind of downside of it is worse than the upside but yeah this is a constant pain in the butt when you're doing with <laughs> dealing with these things because you don't want to waste all your time you know about every little change but at the same time you don't want to accidentally make a change that seemed little but then you find out later oh it's actually really big right you killed all the grandmas because you took out the comma thank you <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Holly. Don't want to make a change that makes grandma for dinner, right? So, yeah. so the consent agenda to do it properly um, for EPPC, let's say, when it comes to if we're in the EPPC meeting, it would just be the consent agenda separate, and then folks would approve the agenda, and then would it would it go first? Is that typically how that would happen? And then yeah, you move into the other business. Yeah, it says in Roberts that it should come before the basically the reports. So it should be right up front. So okay. what you would do is you'd approve the agenda. Then you would say, um, well, there's two versions of it. One is you approve everything on mass. And the other is you, you go through each individual, but there's no debate. Um, the former is usually the more common one. So you'd, you'd approve the agenda. And then you go to this consent agenda and you say, or a consent calendar, you'd say, okay, is there anybody that wants to pull any of these off of here? If the answer is no, then the next thing you do is you say, okay, then let's vote on it. You know, once it passes, I guess it could fail and then you reject everything on the consent agenda. That would be weird, but you know, it could happen. Um, okay. And then you move on and then you go into reports, but it's supposed to happen right up at the top of the agenda. And then procedurally, so if then it comes to Senate, would it then be listed out separately, let's say the FAST consent agenda or the EPPC consent agenda, or would those be together? How is that typically done? Um, that's a good question. I think different um, groups do it in different ways. Um, it's probably wise to, prob to separate them. I mean, technically it doesn't matter, right? Because you know people can pull anything off but to do them in kind of groups of like, here's your EPPC things and here's your uh, other one. <laughs> um, sorry, I just forgot the name. But you know, that, that probably is better just because you're dealing with like things. Um, I don't think it, yeah, I mean, it's probably a little just cleaner, but again, what matters is you, you probably just want to hash this out amongst yourselves and then, you know, write a standing rule that says, okay, here's how we do it, you know. Thank you so much. 
Adam, I don't know if you have your copy there, but I think the section you were looking for, and there's a there's another question in the chat also. Um, I don't know if you've been able to monitor that while you were presenting. It's pretty tough to do the um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, time. I missed a whole bunch of things, sorry. But I think it's just, I think you were only off by two digits um, on the consent calendar. It may have been 4132 rather than 34. Um, yes, it was on the same page. Yeah. 4132, yes. Yeah, it's it was right there. So. Okay, sorry, it's I, I don't things on the fly. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, if the page was open, it should have been visible for anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't have eyeballs. Not you. you. Not I can't you. see above like from a thousand paces. So come on. But the um the other thing is that you know our um one of the things that's really interesting with our uh, in I sent you you know our links to our constitution bylaws, and then we have guidelines for our standing committees um, that kind of govern our business a little bit, and. Um, I think ultimately when you have the constitution or the bylaws for a, for the entirety of the Senate, I think it gets at Miriam's question, which is do the guidelines somehow, the guidelines don't, they don't fall above our own constitution and bylaws. Oh, right. So right, if our right. constitution and bylaws yeah. refer to something as being like, if it's not listed here, it goes to Rob's rules, then then we would go to Rob's rules. So that I think there's some gray um, because we also call them guidelines. We don't call them bylaws for our standing committees. I um, see, I see. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be a different, um, yeah, it, that sounds right to me. I've just never. But maybe that's a higher level, it, like, like intermediary uh, parliamentary uh, presentation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a good, it's an interesting question because my Senate, we basically leave the committees to do their own things, you know. So they, most of them, have like a standard operating procedure kind of thing, um, and that's you know has to be consistent with the bylaws. But yeah, I, I see your point. So my. My point being that essentially if the guidelines have something that violates Robert's rules and we refer to Robert's rules in our constitution and bylaws, then we have a problem. So yeah, in that regard. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's gonna depend on the status that you give the guidelines. And I suggest discussing that and deciding whether they should be you know, a, a standing rule or something because then it would be clearly above that. But yeah, I mean, you don't want to have, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, sorry, somebody had their hand. Oh, uh, Feng? Uh, yes. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for the presentation. It's very informative. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of like a new senator. Um, so I have a question about the, um, the format of voting. Um, I, I'm not sure if the, um, Robert's rule have that specific policy. Um, because based on my observation, um, we vote, we all can see each other's vote, you know, like whose vote. And so as an EPPC meeting or other senator meeting, we use Zoom to, you know, basically if we say yes, we just, you know, reaction will be that uh, mm -hmm. kind of like a green marker. But I, ha I have never seen the red marker. <laughs> so I, because I don't know if mm, we, you know, there's experiment called the Solomon's like uh, um, ash experiment. So there's, mm -hmm. like, you know, they give a standard length of uh, a line. And uh, if you think the particular line match that line, you, you, you see it like, you know, you match uh, like A, B, C, D, different lengths of line match the standard line. But, you know, if people <laughs> like the actor actors there, right, they, they constantly see the wrong one. And everybody like the, the person who actually is the real player it would be even the same thing clearly like you know the bees match the standard line but because everybody else see that so he have this like a social pressure um yep. called the group conformity you know so mm -hmm. and not like you're not really fully take advantage of your right and uh, you just have this pressure because you say no everybody gonna look at you weird you know you're not belonging here like you know we don't want you 
Um, so I think that that kind of format of voting, it does affect uh, the two results, but I don't know if there's anything um, mentioned about the format of voting on, on anonymously or like have to we all look at each other like any Yeah, other? no, this is a really good question. Um, and unfortunately, Robert's Rules is very, um, in part because it's kind of aimed for like public assemblies, um, it's very into kind of everybody mostly your pub, most most of the time your your votes are completely public um in fact you're technically not even supposed to um you know just raise your hand it's actually in when a, in a room you you're supposed to like stand up right <laughs> so it's like you know stand up and be counted kind of thing um this is usually not the best thing for exactly the reasons what you're talking about for our kinds of operations i mean there's a lot of stuff that's fine you know but when, whenever there's any kind of concern about uh, retaliation or pressures like that, um, in my Senate, we have uh, a rule that anything about uh, basically personnel is gonna, it has to be secret. Um, under Rob's, this is like one of the places where I think Robert's rules get it completely wrong. You actually have to have a, um, you'd have to have a, a, a vote to have a secret ballot. But you can see the problem with that, right? It's like, if somebody's afraid of their vote being seen, then they're going to, you know, probably not want to be the person that moves to have a secret ballot. So that's something I um, encourage your Senate to think through. Um, it's probably better to have uh, non public votes, at least for like the, you know, the main vote on something. Um, and one thing I, I'll just share in the ASCSU when we moved to using Zoom, um, and, you know, we, we were using the, the polling function. Um, almost all, I, I can't tell you this for sure, but I'm pretty, like, I don't know the numbers, but the amount of time that there was disagreement that showed up in the non-public vote that never would have been there in the public vote, like almost everything used to pass by basically unanimity, unanimity or just maybe a couple of people um, being in opposition, but you'd see a lot more um, uh, disagreement or disapproval when we move to uh, voting um, anonymously. And that I think is evidence that there was a social pressure there that probably is unwelcome and probably something that we should try to correct against because we want to have a choice, like you said, where people are actually, you know, sort of contributing, not just responding to social pressure. So Do you yeah, primarily vote by polling? Um, in the ASCSU, yes nowadays but we also don't have extra people really in there miriam yeah. that could vote on top of because a poll a poll has it goes to everybody yeah this is why at the beginning of the pandemic i wrote that whole app to, <laughs> to do a, to do the voting because of there was concerns about you know the host being able to see how people voted and concerns about people being authenticated. So it basically authenticates through Canvas so that, you know, we could limit the number, limit the the voters because there was a lot of distrust for certain, for a variety of reasons on my campus at the time. So, um, did I miss anything on the, uh, sorry, I, I was totally spaced on the chat and didn't see any of it. Did, was there anything in there that I- uh, Miriam had I a question about the vote of one being a majority. If mm -hmm. you could cover that again. That's okay. Oh. I think Patrick answered it. Um, oh, but, okay. But in our situation, I mean, if your denominator is one, then one out of one, I get that. Yeah. But in our situation, we don't really know if people are abstaining. I mean, I have, Patrick helps me do the count, but I mean, you know, if their hand isn't raised one way or the other, but you know what I mean? We're going with a majority of our majority. Yeah. We don't, well, I mean, most of the time okay, you don't need to know if there's abstentions. Right. We don't decrease our count by people who aren't voting. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, if nobody votes at all, then you just count it as failed because the, the denominator is zero. If one person votes, then the denominator is one, you know. It's, it's the limit case, right? It's not something that presumably would happen very often, but it's just to make the point that abstentions are just failures to vote. And every Senator has the right to vote and every Senator has the right to not vote for something. And that includes the right, the right to abstain. You can't force people to actually vote. 
I mean, you could, but you'd have to have your own special rules and it would probably be a bad idea. So. Other questions, things that I missed or? Thank you, yeah. And I'm happy to um, answer, you know, um, I think if you checked out the links, I'll put my email address in the chat just in case you don't have it, but I'm always happy to talk about Robert's Wheels of Order, so. Adam, could you also um, grab